You're listening to Catholic Chicago on WNDZ 750 AM. During the next hour, the Archdiocese of Chicago brings you programs about the people, events, and issues that touch our lives. Welcome to Catholic Chicago. Chicago on WNDZ 7:50 a.m. Father Greg Sackowitz, the rector of Holy Name Cathedral, and co-hosting, always backed by popular demand, Mark yeah, Teresi, assistant the rector for plan and development, which happens to be assistant with me. And uh, Mark, how are you this morning? Very good. I'm backed by popular demand because my wife called you and asked you to have me on again. Please, so please thank take you. him, <laughs> get him out of the house. And also, we are second time ever live streaming, and our phone number three one two. Two five five eight four zero eight and Mark and I are socially distancing with masks on. We, I, you take this COVID nineteen very very seriously. No, I notice you have your Bears mask on in anticipation of a win tonight against Tom Brady. I, you know, I've been going back and forth, yes or no, and I think the Bears may sneak one out hmm. in a close game. But boy, Tom Brady and Tampa Bay playing good football, and it's home tonight in Chicago. But again, there's no fans. So it's really not home crowd, but you have your own stadium. But uh, beautiful weather. This week, Mark, has been terrific. Yesterday was glorious. What a glorious. And they're talking yeah. tomorrow to be close to 80. Mm-hmm. Even the weekend, not bad for the next couple of days. So we have a great program lined up here on Catholic Chicago. Again, we are live streaming, and uh, many people are now live streaming us. So keep keep viewing. We've got a great, great lineup today of a tremendous program. Mike Hoffman, who's chairman of the Hope and Healing Committee, a clergy abuse survivor and author of Acts of Recovery, and Tom Thrile. Tom is the director of the Office of Assistance Ministry in the Office for the Protection of Children and Youth, and the ninth annual Mass for Hope and Healing is scheduled to premiere on Saturday, October 24th at 10 a.m. The first Mass was held as part of the dedication of the Healing Garden, which was created as a permanent reminder of clergy sexual abuse and as a, sp- a safe space for victims, survivors, and their families to gather. The Mass has been hosted by the Office of Assistance of Ministry. It was created in 1992. So, Mike and Tom, welcome to the program this morning. How are you, gentlemen? Are you with us? How are you? There you are. Hello, Mike. How are you, Tom? How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having us. Oh, my gosh. In fact, uh, Mike, I go back with your family, Kathy and the children. I got to St. Mary of the Woods in 19. 19- 92, and you arrived in what year with the family? I think, uh, God, it always dates me, Father Greg, but I think it was 2002 uh, we arrived at St. Mary of the Woods. And you and Kathy and the children so involved in the faith community uh, for all those years. And, of course, I left in 2010. And, of course, you still remain active at St. Mary of the Woods. So it, uh, but now... I think we want to have a little bit of a... Well, first of all, if we back up here a little bit, maybe, Tom, for a moment. Uh, Mm -hmm. The office that you're part of was founded in what year? I believe it was in 1992. It was was established by Cardinal Bernadine at the time to respond to victim survivors of clergy sexual abuse, to respond to the... to provide healing and reconciliation was part of their mission. And you've been with the office for how many years? Uh, actually, my anniversary ties in with the math, so nine years. So for nine years. And also then, you know, Mike, you wrote a tremendous book called The Acts of Recovery um, by Act of Publication. And so maybe just for a moment, you are a sexual abuse survivor. And, and briefly, you know, you've been on the program many times, and uh, you're very transparent, you're very honest, you, and your goal is to help those who've been sexually abused to come forward Maybe just briefly for a moment, tell us what happened in terms of how you came forward. Well, sure, of course. So um, I am a uh, childhood sexual abuse survivor by a a clergy uh, who was uh, the priest at the time, was a dear friend to my parents. 
And so uh, my coping mechanism at that time was to keep it all inside. So fast forward 30 years later, um, it's my sincere attempt to live a healthy life. And I would ask all abuse survivors to uh, try to live a healthy life. And, and so in doing so, I felt the need to share my story with my wife, Kathy. And uh, I've shared this with you, Father Greg. Uh, you know, I thought originally my wife might think differently of me as, as her husband or as a provider to our, our children. Um, and obviously she didn't think differently of me. And so uh, she, she heard that story with love and compassion and, uh, and support. And so soon after that experience of telling my wife my story, uh, I frankly turned to you, Father Greg, because I was, I was and remain active at St. Mary of the Woods and I felt that I probably couldn't kind of participate in the life of the liturgy and in the life of the parish if I was keeping this secret inside. And so trusting you and, and knowing you, uh, I reached out to you, Father Greg, and I told you my story of childhood sexual abuse. And um, from there, uh, you encouraged me and, and I then began to feel comfortable to come forward to tell my story to the Archdiocese of Chicago. And that's when, you know, I had met Tom Sorrell and, and Leah McCluskey and Myra Flores. And, and I was met, they received my story with such decency and professionalism and compassion. And, and because of that, and all of that went so well, we're able to we're able to talk about it here today. Now, and, Mike, Mike, let me just ask so, you, uh, your sexual abuse by the priest predator, did it last about four years between like the age of nine and 13, roughly? Uh, that's correct. And the thing is, I remember you said to me, because you've shared the story before and I'm very humbled, that when you came to me, you had this deep fear that I would reject you, call you a liar, it never happened, defend the priesthood and tell you to get out of here? I mean, in so many words. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, if you can imagine, you know, there's some anxiety in, in coming forward to tell such a, a, a perverse and depraved story. And, and I, I was thinking, you know, maybe you might not be able to hear it and process it, and perhaps you might think that I was attacking you or your good ministry or your good character, and of course I would I would never do that, but that was some of the anxiety that I felt when I was uh, coming forward and telling my story to you. Now, Mike, then you moved that story because I was there at St. Mary of the Woods. It you told you shared your story with the whole parish, and uh, I'm curious as you did that. It took a lot of courage. Um, it was probably the next step in terms of your healing, but what was the reaction? I mean, people knew you as involved in the parish. All of a sudden, you're up there telling this story. Um, what were parishioner reactions, your friends' reactions to that? The, um, the, there, there are wide reactions. Um, I can summarize that in saying it was my, my, my effort to tell the parish my story was my effort to remain comfortable and have my heart be opened in the parish community. And I was received by the parish with nothing but love and compassion. You know, so many people said, I'm so glad to hear you share your story. So sorry that it happened. But now that we know that it happened and we know that the archdiocese reaches out to other victims, survivors, and that I have personally received many services from the archdiocese and my family has been received has received many services that that the regular catholics in the pew were comforted to know that outreach services are there and and long-standing with the support of all the priests and the leadership of the archdiocese to heal these wounds caused by clergy abuse of children now tom 
Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 you know, Mike, you're a parent. T- Tom, you work every day in this area. How, you know, it's such a, a, a devious, deadly sin. How, what should parents be looking for if, if uh, their kids come to them with messages uh, that somebody, you know, is abusing them? Maybe, maybe they won't say it outright, but what should parents be aware of? Well, I think some of the things are, you know, is your child acting differently? First of all, if your child tells you something, if, if you have a child who does directly tell you something, to take it seriously and to act on it and to follow up on that. But often you'll see signs like either their grades may be slipping a little bit, they may be, their behaviors may be a little bit different. You'll start to get clues that suggest something is off, and then you can take some steps to check that out. And, you know, to the credit of the Safe Environment Office, I mean, they're trying to do and have done a lot to try to prevent some of this from happening. I mean, what you heard from Mike is a fairly common story, especially for men, you know, that it's not uncommon for them. I think the data is that they wait about 25 years or so before they're ready to come forward. And they also, like Mike talked about, feel the shame and the embarrassment and the confusion and the fear of what's going to happen if I come forward and talk about this. Will I be supported? So um, it's a it's a big deal what Mike is doing today. Yeah, I do want to say that uh, the office you work with, Tom, mm-hmm. you and your colleagues, I have the highest compliments. You do such tremendous work with compassion, empathy. You listen. And Mike will be the first one to agree with me because when Mike shared his story with me, I think it was back in 2006, Mike? Uh, Yes, that's correct. And the thing is, um, I said, you need to go to the Office of Protection of God's Children, it was called then, and you did, but you were hesitant because you were afraid, are they going to slam you, reject you, say never happened, grill you, but you were met with such compassion. Now, one question, I know you've been asked many, many times, you kept this secret for 25 or 30 years before you finally came forward to Kathy and then to me. What triggered, after all those years, to finally say, I can't keep this inside anymore? Well, sure. Um, I had read um, in the summer of 2006, there was a, a story in the Chicago Tribune about another uh, abuse survivor who was, uh, frankly, suing the Archdiocese of Chicago, and, and I knew the, the boy. He was a friend of mine at the time, and it was, uh, frankly, the lawsuit was related to the same mm-hmm. abuser. And so seeing the abuser's name and seeing the location of abuse and, and reading the name of, of a, a guy I knew at the time um, triggered all of those memories that I had, frankly, normalized. I thought the, the ongoing anxiety I was feeling every day was normal. But then I realized, you know, the full loss of the innocence of my youth and how, in fact, traumatic that relationship with that particular priest was to me and my family and how disruptive it was. So with all of that flooding over me as a trigger, uh, I, I wrestled with that for a couple of days, and then I finally decided, you know, almost in a near, frankly, almost in a near panic, I, I decided to trust my wife, and I told her my most difficult story. And thank God, uh, truly thank God I did that. Um, for me, you know, healing begins at home. And, uh, um, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, th- that's my story. Mm-hmm. We're going to take a little break. Um, Tom and Mike, we'll be back in just a few minutes, 7.50 a.m., Catholic Chicago, 312-255-8408. When we come back, I really would like to discuss with you and Father Greg, how has the church's position changed from 25 years ago to now in terms of how the church looks at these issues, starting at the top? with Pope Francis. Uh, We will be back in a few minutes. Please stay tuned.
you're invited to Keep Hope Alive 2020, the online benefit and celebration of the Archdiocese of Chicago's Immigration Ministry and their nationwide program, Pastoral Migratoria. Join us virtually on the evening of Thursday, October 29th for a night filled with music, camaraderie, and inspiring speakers. Cardinal Blaise Supich and Sister Norma Pimentel of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley, who was recently recognized as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, will be joining us to help keep hope alive. Now, more than ever, the immigrant community, both here in the Archdiocese of Chicago and across the United States, needs the leadership formation and accompaniment that Pastoral Migratoria provides. Registration is free, and sponsorship and advertising opportunities are available. Visit www.keephopealive2020.org for more information and to register. Again, that's www.keephopealive2020.org. When you think of the word neighbor, warm and friendly thoughts come to mind. Think of smiles across the yard, positive wishes, and looking out for one another on an ongoing basis. Catholic Charities Neighbors in Need Fund inspires all of these and much more. We've seen an unprecedented number of requests for assistance this year from people who have never needed help before. When you make your gift to the Neighbors in Need Fund, you are igniting hope in the lives of your most vulnerable neighbors, especially individuals and families who continue to struggle to put food on the table and keep a roof over their heads. Your gift will give them the resources they need to overcome the unexpected, very serious circumstances in which they find themselves now. Give online at catholiccharities.net or call 312-948-6087. That's 312-948-6087. Catholic Charities Neighbors in Need Fund. Thank you for helping build a world of kindness, one neighbor to another. Have you checked out Chicago Catholic lately? Either in print or online, Chicago Catholic has informative and stimulating content, including news from the Archdiocese, beautiful photographs, and a thoughtful column by our publisher, Cardinal Blaise Supich. Editor Joyce DeRiga tells us about our current edition of Chicago Catholic. We have an overview of Pope Francis's new encyclical on fraternity and social friendship. Cardinal Supich's column is also dedicated to it. The Archdiocese is urging everyone to get a flu shot this year. We share the details of the campaign, and we have coverage of the recent ordination of permanent deacons. Subscribe now. Go to chicagocatholic.com or call 312-534-7777. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Chicago Catholic, a fresh approach to Catholic news. back, WNDZ 750 AM on your dial. Father Greg Sackowitz here, Mark Teresi, we're safe distancing, we're masked, and we're sharing some very important stories and information with Mike and Tom regarding uh, an annual Mass for Hope and Healing. But before we talk about our annual Mass for Hope and Healing, I had a question. A few months ago in our <laughs> studio, we had a gentleman from Chile who was abused. And uh, was able in some miraculous way to have direct contact with the Pope. The Pope called him in. Uh, we also had the priest who is the Pope's person representative in terms of this issue of abuse. And um, it sounded like Pope Francis take, is taking this extremely to heart and the church's stance is becoming even stronger as an advocate for abuse victims. Can either of you comment on that from you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago to now, where is the church in terms of this issue? Yeah, I, I can take a crack at it. I mean, I can say 25, 30 years ago, I think there was, you know, there was a lot of confusion about, well, do you believe the story? Who do you, you know, who's telling the truth? Is the church telling the truth? Is, you know, are the opponents of the church telling the truth? That kind of thing. I think what's evolved over time is, one, there's a general belief that, yes, this did occur, that children were being abused by priests. And I think what's shifted is a growing awareness of what the Church is doing. You know, for example, if a victim survivor comes forward, we immediately offer them outreach. We immediately offer them support. And, you know, one of the things that probably isn't talked about much is, 
you know, there is an independent review board, for example, and on that board is a victim survivor to speak to the concerns of what would a victim survivor think. And another thing that probably isn't talked about much is very often as part of this process, when a victim survivor comes forward, after they've shared the story, after they've gone through therapy, after they've done some of this work, one thing that they often want is to somehow be able to tell their story to the cardinal. And the cardinal's been available for that. And I've had the chance to witness that um, and be there for those moments. And it's a very healing moment for someone to say, I need you to own some of the story with me. And the cardinal's been very responsive. And I think there's, it's, a, it's a healing moment that doesn't really get talked about much. Now, before I forget this, uh, Tom, if somebody wanted to write now a listener who would like maybe come forward and talk with you or someone from the office, give us a phone number. Uh, you know, I'm going to, it's been so long since I've been in the office because of this COVID. I mean, 312-534-8267. One more time. Uh, 312-534-8267. Or it might even be easier to just go on our, on the Office of Assistance Ministry website and just click on the link and it'll send an email to me uh, and have all the information. So they, do they go to um, artchicago.org and then click in from there? Yeah, just go to Office of Assistance Ministry. So you first go to you know www.archchicago.org and then go to what Tom talked about. Can and you can what what might if someone is listening and ready to do that? What might they expect in terms of that connect? Oh sure, I can um, speak to that personally. Um, when I was reaching out at that time, um, I wrote a letter uh, to the archdiocese. And within a, a week, possibly 10 days, I received an immediate response back from Leah McCluskey, um, welcoming me, uh, inviting me to share my story, um, frankly saying it's, it's okay. You know, to go back to your previous um, question, Mark, yeah, from the survivor's perspective, there is some, you know, anxiety, potential anxiety, but, you know, thinking – Boy, if I come forward to share my story to the to church or church officials, will they believe me? And I can personally attest to the fact that I was received very well and I was believed. And so I did tell my story to Leah McCluskey, who is the liaison to the um, Independent Review Board. And within a few weeks after that, you get a response. And within a few weeks after that, uh, I received, frankly, a, a letter um, from Leah saying that Cardinal George, that, that dates me, that how far back I, I came forward with this, Cardinal George has accepted the review board's determina determination that a misconduct did occur. And that made me feel good. Yeah. I was yeah. happy that I was believed by the church. And um, I would uh, tell any survivor uh, who's listening or any family member who wants to suggest this to the survivor that you will be well-received and met with decency and compassion when you come forward and tell your story. Now, Mike, if you connect that, a very important event is happening. The ninth Annual Mass for Hope and Healing is scheduled for Saturday, October 24th at 10 a.m. I think it's at Holy Family. Well, this, this year in particular, because of COVID, it is online, okay. and so it, it premieres that day. Um, but in all regular years, uh, it has been at Holy Family Church. Uh, the first one was led by uh, Cardinal George, and uh, we've had support from Cardinal George and Cardinal Supich for all this time, so nine years of support, you know, support from the leadership for this public outreach, you know, acknowledging the healing that is needed for all abuse survivors, no matter who was a perpetrator, and their family members, and and that obviously then relates to the healing needed for our church as a whole. Now, this healing garden and the healing mass of healing and hope, if I'm not mistaken, this was your idea, correct? Going back nine years ago. Uh, well, uh, no, with I, others. I was par part of the team, and I was the chairman of that particular planning committee. And um, it, it was with 
um, Matt, Matt Honeycutt, who was, you know, in Tom's position prior to that, we had presented, frankly, an idea to Cardinal George, you know, how, you know, how can we, you know, have a public apology, but more than a public apology, a public place of healing and reconciliation. And the Cardinal had embraced this idea, and we put together a committee of four clergy abuse survivors, two priests. At, at that time, it was Father Dowling and Father Jerry Bolin, and then staff members from Tom's office, the Office of Assistance Ministry. And within you know two years of meeting, we had we've been able to produce a beautiful, beautiful healing garden, uh, which was dedicated in uh, 2011. So then on October 24th at 10 a.m., how does someone get on to be part of this uh, Mass of Healing and Hope? I I'll believe defer that to Tom. Well, I believe right now they're in the midst of you know, trying to put it all together. So what we ended up doing was we ended up getting some different video pieces from people locally, as well as victim survivors from different parts of the country, and even as far as Australia, people who have connected with our offices and connected to other victim survivors locally, like Mike. And so there will be a link available on the Archdiocese website, and as we get that, it will be promoted more. I, the thing is that um, I think it's very important when you started this, Mike, along with that team. Uh, in fact, is, is there a shift right now, I'd ask both of Tom and Mike, that in terms of, We've been talking about this for many years, which is incredibly important. But, Mike, I think recently you have changed your focus a bit to talk about, besides a sense of hope and healing, there's another word you've been using, which has been a very good word, uh, but about moving forward. Can you say more about that? Well, sure. So I, I believe that with my whole heart and soul, you know, one of the ways, the best ways to move forward is, is abuse survivors sharing their stories and, and people hearing and believing their stories, but also working side by side with priests like yourself, Father Greg and Father Larry Dowling and Father Mike Gabriel and staff members like Tom and, and his office to produce a good result, to produce masses and prayer services, of hope and healing that frankly acknowledge the Catholic identity still of the abuse survivor and acknowledge the Catholic history, you know, there's, there's so much hope and healing we can do together if we can talk about it. And having, you know, one of the, the ways that Healing Garden Committee was so successful was that there were four clergy abuse survivors working side by side with priests and staff. You know, I Mike, think that's the model. Mike, could you, you know, even though we're in COVID, the garden's outside. If someone has an inkling to want to visit the garden and just be there and pray and think about their situation and get some, you know, energy around this for them, where is it? And, and what's the address? How do people get there? It's outside, so it's safe. Yes, it, it's safe, and it's literally stunningly beautiful right now mm -hmm. uh, with the fall colors. It is uh, directly adjacent to Holy Family Church in Chicago on Roosevelt Road, which is kind of on the campus of St. Ignatius College Prep. And yes. as you park right next to Holy Family, you'll walk literally right in front of the Healing Garden of the Archdiocese of Chicago. And yes, all are invited to uh, reflect and to pray and to breathe and to um, kind of come to, to reconciliation about the things that do happen to us in our lives uh, and you're in a safe space, like you said, Mark. And I, I may be eating lunch there on the bench. You know, sometimes I go there myself, and and uh, it's it's a beautiful place to go. And that, no, we need to bring this segment to a close. Uh, before, before we close, Tom, one more time, give us a phone number and a website okay, okay. for people to learn more. I'm going to give you the correct phone number. What I realized <laughs> is right before we left for COVID, my not my phone had been changed. So the correct number is three one two five three four. Three three eight zero. One more time. Three one two five three four three three eight zero. And the web? It's uh, Art Chicago, and then look up Office of Assistance Ministry. I want to thank Art, you very. Go, go one more time. Art Chicago, 
Office of Assistance Ministry. I want to thank in a very special way Mike Kaufman, Chairman of the Hope and Healing Committee, and Tom Thrill is the Director of the Office of Assistance Ministry in the Office of Protection of God's Children, Children and, and Youth. Mike and Tom, thank you very much for joining us. Mike, give my love to the family. Both of you doing tremendous work in this whole important area. You're listening to Catholic Chicago on WNDZ, 750 AM, 312-255-8408. Father Greg Sackowitz and Mark Tracy will be back in a few minutes. Stay with us, and again, do not touch that dial. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Bye.